I heard an interesting quote somewhere. It said that anybody can argue for themselves for their own cause, but it takes a much higher level of intellect to argue against yourself and make it formidable. Over my time, I've tailored a line of boats to take out kayaks, but for one time only, I'm gonna try and a kayak to take out them. I must become the anti-me. Where if I were to view myself on YouTube and being like, what is this smug little always oh, talking crap about kayaks and thinking he's better than everyone. Someone needs to put him in his place and that someone is gonna be me. I have just two quick reminders and they are very important. Otherwise I wouldn't waste my time even talking about them. Here they are. You know the Minn Kota Endura, the transit mount trolling motor we all grew up with and loved. What if I told you there's a drop in mod that will break the market? change everything forever. I'm talking about something that will give this motor spot lock, nav lock heading, GPS, all of it for way cheaper than anything else on the market. Check out the link for pre-sales below. Also, we are giving away this boat. Hope you haven't forgot. And if you have, remember to register. Go to our website, tbnation.net, click on the pop-up and enter to win because I will be driving this thing out to somebody here in the fall. And hopefully that one person is you, but you'll never know unless you enter you know, just saying. So what do kayaks have as far as strengths and weaknesses? So for one, they're very portable. Even the heaviest kayaks are still more portable than the average boat. And that includes other plastic boats as well. As far as propulsion goes, it can be used one of three ways, pedal, paddle, or electric assist. And that is a big deal in terms of going anywhere and never being stranded, ever. And while you're propelling yourself, they tend to glide much more effortlessly versus their boat counterparts. Even the larger flagship fishing kayaks, like a Hobie Pro Angler, or in this case, this Feel Free Dorado, kayaks whom people have claimed lost their way and have become essentially boats, still hold the most important parts of a kayak, which is what we just talked about, as they do not handle like boats at all even tiny boats, the same size. I have a 48 volt, three horsepower equivalent on that Palm Prowler, and I'm just barely beating him, and all he has is a 12 volt system through the overdrive. And because of their slick, easy to propel design, they could be pushed right over weed mats with a paddle, and that is pretty invaluable. That's something most boats simply cannot do. But as far as weaknesses, the kayak, it constantly gets owned in the wind, even one like this, as capable as it is, with an electric drive still gets owned pretty badly. It can never fully straighten out because the whole thing turns like a minivan, and that's pretty much all big kayaks that I've ever been on. To be fair, small boats get owned by the wind in general, but the kayaks, they do exceptionally bad. I mean, I've never seen anything like it, except for maybe an inflatable. And people who are modding the front with XI3s are often voiding the warranty once they drill into the hull, which is plastic and not meant for that. So part of this video will be showing you how to add Spalock to this kayak without voiding the warranty for half the price of an XI3. Yes, we will be including that in this video. Stay tuned. Did I mention I've had this kayak for over a year with the intent of modding it and just never did? Most of it was because I was stumped. I really didn't know what to do about it. There's only so many things you can do to this before you void the warranty of the hull. So I had to rethink completely how we were gonna even take this project on. And the answer was simply, we don't. We just put things on top of it a bunch of drop-in mods with no permanent mounting. I took eighth inch flat bar and bent it with a brake. And that is gonna be the only way I secure this whole mod in the back to the kayak. We welded an aluminum box up. We kind of overbuilt it because it's gonna be the main structure to hold what we were gonna to try to do as anchors. A system that can be flipped up and folded over on top of the kayak during travel. I had tremendous success with this modification for the Palm Prowler 10, but this one will have to be sleeker and smaller and lighter because of what it's going on. We use nylon bushings in between the plates and the beams themselves. This will allow you to tightly fasten the beams to the plates with no metal to metal rubbing and smooth gliding action. If you're wondering whether or not these could be made long term with bolts and rivets to secure the entire thing, no, I've tried. So part of it has to be welded, there's no choice. Good thing is we are making light duty anchors so we can get away with eighth inch tubing. The only thing that is thicker than that are the plates themselves that hold up the tension. Now for the tricky part, how to mount this to the box itself. We overbuilt the box inside with eighth inch angle framing specifically because it was gonna be the force that held the entire anchor system together. The strategy is to make a plate that mounts to the box like so on a 90 degree, but then extends over the back handle and somehow we clamp this plate to the back handle. We've now welded the anchor base to its own piece 
and it is linked to 8th inch flat bar that we're going to then hinge on that whole system. This is how it will flip up and down and still have rigidity once it flips down as it will secure to this 3 16th inch plate underneath. We're using quarter 20 stainless hardware to fasten the entire thing together and we're also honing and porting out certain parts of it for aesthetics and also for lightness. At first glance, it appears to look like the initial strategy will work. The box is just loosely welded. There has been no waterproofing or finishing. We still have to come up with a way to make it aesthetically pleasing, add rod holders on each side, and add a nice collective like water resistant lid on top of this and still allow enough room inside to hold tackle plus possibly a small lithium battery if we tend to go that far and make it a multi-purpose box with different layers. I had constant thoughts on how it was I was ever going to stow and deploy these at will. And my best answer was to make a connection, a series of levers that can be controlled by the seat of the kayak where you don't have to go back and actually do anything. You can just flip them up at will with each hand. And then somehow all the entire mechanism stows and deploys unison when we flip the anchors over. We already came to the conclusion that a bar needs to be there for the initial leverage, but then all the linkage itself needs to be made in a place for it to be stowed. We start this by bending angle and kind of modifying it on the end. And these will be the spots where the linkage starts to pivot. And we conveniently have just enough room to go ahead and weld that to the back of the box. By the way, I don't recommend welding inside plastic kayaks like this, but for the sake of getting everything to line up appropriately, I went and tacked it as loosely as I could, but still holding it all together. That way I could stick it on top of a makeshift weld table like this thing and just finish it off. Slowly but surely I start to work it so it looks at least decent, but a bigger task has come apart before we can do anything else. How do we make a top lid? I decided to make an inch wide top by using half inch 16 gauge tubing on the inside and the outside of the rim, making a new rim that you could actually put a lid on. But then there's the issue with the dry track. We can't actually put bleed outs underneath, so we have to make a diversion lid. So we've done this before, but it's been an all riveted system. It's called the, our built from scratch system. Only this time, instead of riveting everything together, we have the added benefit of welding. O90 piece of sheet metal, and that is 16 gauge by half inch angle. We had to keep spinning it and working it and tacking it and going at it to make sure we didn't warp the whole thing because it's thin. <laughs> we finally got an end product and it wasn't half bad. You can essentially make your own hatches from scratch just like this. I welded another strip of half inch tubing on each side adjacent to the top and that is how I will now secure our rod holders which are fabricated out of aluminum conveniently. If this whole thing fits out correctly, in theory, it should provide four major functions to stow tackle and gear, to hold your rods, to stow and deploy the anchor system, and to act as an additional grab handle since we're eating up all that spot in the back. We're prepping it for paint by etching it with, I think, 60 or 50 grit sandpaper. That might have even been 40 grit. Then after we've etched the surface with the orbital sander, we're going to double etch it with this aluminum etch wash from Total Boat. Spray a copious amount of it. Make sure it is staying damp with the fluid. Do not let it dry. It only needs 20 to 30 seconds to do its job. So while it's still wet with the acid, go ahead and spray it off. And you can watch all the contaminants rinse right off of it. And prior to this, we did prep it with acetone and denatured alcohol together and still look at everything else that's left. Once you use the aluminum etch wash from Total Boat, it brings it to a completely different level of etching. And the aluminum is now actually sticky. And after this part, you want it to air dry. But here's the thing, aluminum starts to oxidize again in as little as 15 minutes. So to make sure that this air dries completely, we're going to put it and we're going to blow it out with an air compressor. We didn't show you this, but I did that to speed up the dry time. That way I can stay in that 15 minute window. If I can paint or I can primer the surface within that 15 minute window, as clean as the aluminum is right now, we'll get the best adhesion of the primer that I will ever get out of any other time. And the whole thing about this process is people are always worried about self-etching primer, epoxy primer, this and that. If you do this process, you can use literally any primer. And my favorite, most robust primer to use is actually Ace Rust Stop. And I know, I don't know what it is about it, but it's the best primer, the most robust and durable primer. The paint will always scratch. I have never really found a truly durable like spray paint 
but as far as primer goes, this stuff's as tough as it gets. So I choose to use it. And once that's cured, we go ahead and prep the primer and then move on to the painting. For this, we are using Aluma Blast by Seymour. I found this stuff at AutoZone. I always find that the automotive paints are just a little bit more robust and longer lasting and just overall better than, you know, your average paint at the hardware store. So I can get the smooth aluminum look without ever having to worry about it discoloring or oxidizing and looking like crap later. And as I mentioned that no spray paint is terribly durable, what makes it durable is clear coat. I've just come to find this out over time. And the best stuff I, I found, I mean, that's cheap, cost effective, is this Duplicolor 1K clear coat, also from AutoZone. Using it in the recommended dry and recoat times, it works really well for a nice finish that has been really robust, and this has been tested by me extensively. It actually looks really good. Would have looked a little better if I wasn't really impatient with this thing at like two in the morning. It's the only time I actually can paint because it's not a million degrees. Later on, there was a cool day and I took full advantage of that. You just have to have a set amount of time somewhere else to paint it because it takes way longer to paint and let it dry and cure than it does to actually make the pieces. And this is not even all of them. Sure, the box and the parts for the anchors are done, but what about the entire base that connects the two together? The base that holds the entire chassis together so this whole thing works, like what I have in my head, is so important that without it, all I have are just some aluminum like egg crates, which I could have just went and bought cosmetic plastic ones that are just sold in the general market. And then all we have is just a bunch of glorified kayak mods. If we're gonna make our own DIY egg crate knockoff, we might as well make it in style and do things that nobody else does, like add EVA foam inside the compartments to cut down and the temperature inside the box tremendously. So anything you stick in there will last a lot longer and be in a lot better shape over time as long as it's stowed there. Also welding that diversion lip right on the top like that looks really ugly. So we're gonna go ahead and fix that up with Gator Skin's rubber non-skid matting. There's still nothing better on the market in terms of aesthetics and doing what it does. And for aesthetics and safety, we are going to be lining the entire lip with door edge guard. You can get this stuff off Amazon, pretty cheap. We also plan to EVA foam the outside. And this is our house brand. TBN camo color from HydroTurf. We are the exclusive holders of this color. It is, in my opinion, the best, most versatile, and most appealing color you can get. We also line the outside with gator skins as well because we want to protect the rails and the rods while they're in there. And for those little unfortunate ends where we couldn't actually put rubber matting on there, we put rubber liquid tape on there. And it actually matches up directly with black non-skid. We cleaned it up a little bit later, but the whole thing is it's sealed on the top and it's ready for rods to be set in there with no damage from the aluminum. Also, because we know what metal will do long-term if it's just left to rub and bind on plastic, we either EVA foamed underneath or gator matted underneath all parts that are gonna be connecting directly on top of the Dorado hull. This will also dampen any clinging and vibrating on the metal while you're using your craft. Since this part is going to be covering up the stock grab handle in the back, we made two additional grab handles. This one giant one, which we will use when the anchors are in full fold, and then the other one behind that, which is useful when the anchors are actually in the stow position. And the piece just bolts on directly to the box back there where there's a space made for it, and it can be taken off for repair or simply just for convenience. And after doing all that, finally a vision turns into reality, and it all fits together. It looks even better than I thought it did in my head. Why did I do all this versus just making a platform to put micro anchors on? Because even the most basic manual Crab Lake-like design is better than any sort of spud pull, whether it's manual or electronic. Leg designs by themselves will not tweak and turn around and bind like spud pulls will. There will be no binding against the motor to where it can actually get the pull up and you have to go back there and pull it up manually anyways. And once we add all the linkage, you'll be able to stow and deploy these right next to the seat with a lever system and you can put them in as quietly and slowly as you want to not spook the fish or as rapidly and fast as you need. Hey, those Minn Kota Enduros you see in Walmart for cheap? What if I told you you can make it a spot lock trolling motor? With a drop-in mod system that is low profile to the trolling motor itself, connecting to a plug and play system that gives you complete autopilot features with a remote and even a phone app. 
The system is super easy to install. It's plug and play, mounts directly to your battery with already pre-assembled terminals coming out of the main pro system. And then you just connect it to your trolley motor like so, and you have now turned to Minn Kota Endura, one of the cheapest, oldest, staple trolley motors in the fishing industry, into a spot lock trolley motor that will compete against the most elite of them out there and do all the same features. And it costs substantially less than even the cheapest of the spot lock trolley motors out there. There is finally GPS autopilot trolling motors for the people, for small watercraft, for tiny boats, and even here for kayaks. All you need is a Minn Kota Endura or equivalent and the autoboat system, and then you're ready to go. But before any of that, we have to make a mount for the trolling motor. I want to reverse engineer the part that actually folds the Endura in. So instead of having to clamp it inwards, you have it so it clamps and pulls outwards. That way I can pull it with shot line and I can stow and deploy it at will from the kayak seat. But first I have to make a base. And this is not just any base. This is a base that's gonna to have to do multiple things. You can find short, simple bases on Amazon or at any kayak shop that will allow you to add a transit mod like this. We're just gonna to have to go a little further. The mount we made will stretch all the way into the ends where the initial screws for the bungee cord that held the front stow we just replaced that. Also, the trolling motor handle on this Endura is going to be pretty useless because we're no longer going to need it. It just needs to be constantly set in seats speed five. So we cut it short right at the very end, leaving the actual speed numbers there that you can assess. But that's not that I want to do. I want to take it one step further. And clearly you don't need to do this if you're willing to go up there and grab the lever every time to stow the trolling motor, but I want to stow from the seat. And the only way to do that is I have to reverse engineer the stow lever to go backwards. To do this, I took plates, mounted it around the main base, and used it as a way to divert the screw angle so that the lever could be faced the other way. This will then actuate the spring fork, which goes and slots and locks into the motor mount itself. To make the new holes for the new axle, we had to drill through the plates and mount them like so. And this works pretty well. The only thing we'll need to do is add another pin to stop the lever from pulling so far forward it disengages completely. But when we pull the lever backwards now, it stows and locks back in place as we need. We'll have to cut the tongue on the top ever so slightly so that it will clear the flange right there. And then once that's done, we can actually drill a hole and mount the paracord. To direct the paracord so that it guides smooth and pulls straight every time, we're going to use a Harkin pulley, well known in the kayak industry. There are several different styles of pulleys, just like this for kayaks, made specifically for pull cords like the one we're about to rig. So plan A passed, otherwise we're going to have to go plan B and mount that thing in the back. But since it works in the front, we're going to go ahead and mount the rest of the auto boat system. The auto drive and the gear cam both attach to the shaft. Once the trolling motor is out of stow and vertical, then sheer gravity pulls the gear cam into the motor. And once it's locked in place, the motor controls the direction the shaft goes. The last piece in this two part plug and play system is the GPS heading unit itself which mounts like so at the top of the motor head. Both the auto drive motor and the GPS heading unit plug directly into the pro system with IP rated connectors. And the pro system is then powered by the battery source. It controls the voltage of the motor and obviously how it turns and what guides it. <laughs> I let out that devious laugh because I really couldn't believe it until I saw it for myself. I mean, I saw it in Florida, but to install it and have it working now in front of me on a project of mine, if somebody would have told me way back then that one day Minn Kota Enduras would have spot lock, I would just look at that person and you know, tell them they're insane. Would have told them that the market only allows for the richest and smuggest of fishermen to own that, and that it would never be truly affordable for the mainstream public. But here it is, spot lock for the masses. If I were you, I would dig that old Minn Kota Endura trolling motor we all know have sitting in the back of our garage that we used back when we were teenagers. Bust that thing out, get one of these units, and get going. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, not eight speeds. Before you had five, you have eight, so you have a better spread of speed now. Versus you had to go through one through four, where pretty much 
not very far from each other and then five was obviously like tremendously higher now you have a little bit of variation speed between four and five through eight speeds this very prototype mock-up design is not done yet or sturdy yet but it will be and this will all be really nicely done and this is my new spot lock that's all i need it's super light compact easy to stow easy to put away it's portable the whole unit itself fits right on the trolling motor and you can barely tell it's there. Hey ladies and gentlemen, if you're still here and you like the content you're seeing, please leave a like and a comment and a share and even a subscribe if you want. It helps this channel out more than you'll ever know. All right, back into it. Now that we've got all that figured out and it's gonna work, we're gonna go ahead and finish this mock-up. We only did the bottom, now we're gonna do the rest of it. Just like the back, the front will serve multiple purposes for max efficiency, but I'm also trying to take some risks here and add some aesthetic value. Building the bowfishing rig and the palm prowler, those two projects alone advanced my skill to the point where I could not only weld aluminum, but make it aesthetically pleasing to some degree. Now that degree will advance the more I do these things, but in order to get there, you have to do it first. If we build this right, then we'll be able to make a platform on top of it. While allowing the mesh on the side to be the vent to keep everything cool, including the battery and the black box for the live scope, while also being the trolling motor base. If you're gonna do something like this, make sure you put either foam or some sort of rubber matting, as you definitely want some sort of buffer between this box and the hull, because if that trolling motor is pulling and torquing and doing all these weird things, that definitely will have some metal and plastic rubbing and therefore damage. Also, look into what voids your hull's warranty. I know everybody with a Hobie Pro Angler who installed an XI3 up front up here. If the minute you drilled into that hull, you voided the warranty. So it's important to me that I can still maintain that. How I plan to do it is in the side, there are screw holes that initially held the bungees. And that is the only place where we're actually gonna screw this front platform to the hull. The rest is just gonna be a piece that fits right underneath the grab handle and holds it all in place. This platform should hold firm with virtually no augmentation to the hull. So now let's finish off the top of the platform and the secondary battery box. We went old school. Just like with the back storage compartment, we made our own front part with the base and the lid. All being made out from the same method as we use with our build from scratch, which is riveting aluminum onto a frame. Only instead of using brackets that we riveted into there, we welded it, which helped because, well, these were awkward shaped lids. And the battery box that we form is also gonna have to be shaped like the hatches and just in order to fit in there. If this all works, like I think it will, we'll be able to stick the Autoboat Pro System box with a battery and also have room for the black box somewhere up in this front compartment. And that'll be completely out of the way with virtually no wiring headache and mess to look at. This is working well. This will fit the battery and all the other things we talked about earlier. And we're doing all that essentially so we can run an advanced fish finder system and a graph system, but we haven't even developed those things yet. And didn't want to do them yet until the bottom end was taken care of. But now that it is, let's make the graph mount. Let's make a mount capable of holding dual graphs. And it's gonna fit right there in that little symmetrically rectangular spot, which I think is meant for a fish finder. I mean, they have fish finder leads inside the main front compartment of the Dorado. Um, so I'm guessing it's supposed to just be there. We just make a spot there and we attach it right directly into the molding itself, which is pretty thick and robust. The back anchor system is 95% complete. Everything works. The lever system works as advertised. We won't know how well it will actually do until it's on the water, but I have a very good feeling about them. I think they will do well, especially since there's two of them. They should be able to hold me in the wind and keep me straight. It would have been a lot better if I had flared them out, but if I had flared them out, then I would have to add a linear actuator to them. There would be no way I could use a manual lever system like the one I developed here. I also made the front buffer plate for the clamp-on of the transom trolling motor with Kusa board. 
which will last much longer than its wood counterpart. I added a bottom clamping piece that we ended up welding and shaping out to fit like so. The tackle storage is large enough to hold several tackle boxes plus gear bags and food and anything else you might need. So it's kind of an overcompensatingly large box because there's nothing else anywhere to store stuff. I actually had other ideas. I really wanted to go super aggressive with the storage back here and make something even bigger than this, but I had to stop myself because I don't even know if this will all work. It's all gonna come in time. Putting that trolling motor up there frees up the middle core and that allows me to make a live scope turret and a really nice one that just drops right in there flush and gives me all the benefits of this graph. I think this, in conjunction with everything else, will make this kayak exceptional. There's just one problem. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna pull it off. I was actually banking on this, so the fact that this clamp on right here with the stock setup doesn't actually fit through the port is devastating. So either I figure out a new way to make this work, or I just made that fancy double graph mount for nothing. The Dorado also came with a retractable transducer mount, but it's just not going to be able to work with the UHD transducer for the Garmin. So I'll probably likely only run one graph, but it still has to be ran right with pen optics. So with that, I set to make a base to replace the spot where the overdrive is. And that's another reason I bought this kayak, because it was a completely square opening. And what you can do with a square opening is a lot more than what you can do with, say, a Hobie Mirage Drive opening or any of the other really seriously augmented ones that are unmoddable. This kayak is extremely moddable. Without this kayak's base mods, without its symmetry, without a lot of the openness that it had, I would never be able to pull any of this off. Making a cap alone gives me the option to not have to run the overdrive in there, but it also gives me the better option to run a turret right through it. We just have to make a turret shaft that will fit through that opening. The only option I can think of is to offset where the mount goes. The LBS-34 transducer comes with multiple options for mounting it, one of which we will modify flat to fit against that plate. And in doing so, the transducer mount will actually fit more in line with the shaft itself than the other stock setup we were trying to run. If this doesn't work, then that cap will just end up having to stay a cap. But if it does work, then there is now a very serious option on the table to make the cleanest live scope turret for a kayak ever. Now for this seemingly trickier, but really not that hard part of lining it all up so when we drill the hole, it actually lines up with the turret and we don't make it go sideways. We're using 8th inch thick Schedule 40 6061 aluminum pipe. And the piping has different sizing versus tubing, and they don't necessarily fit perfectly into each other. But the ability to add metal to the parent pipe through welding, we can actually get a precision fit of the piping sliding into each other, and we can end up with something like this. We welded larger external tubing to the plate to house the parent shaft with enough travel downward to deploy the transducer, just enough underneath the kayak to clear a full 360 motion. This mod saved the entire idea of adding live scope to this kayak to begin with. I've caught a lot of heat so far for taking on this project. The more I posted about it, the more pushback I've gotten, both from the kayak community and the regular boat community. They ask me why I don't just buy a John boat or a bass boat, as if I don't already have 10 of those. They say I've gone too far with this, that this is a floating death trap, that it'll immediately sink or tip over and I'll lose everything. Under normal circumstances, collective feedback like that when it's so heavily set against you is something you should consider. The only time that you can neglect feedback like that is when you can see things nobody else can. Perhaps the reason for confusion is they're not asking the right question. Market trends and influencers have cultivated a disparity between what people find valuable and what people think is cheap. I'm here to tell you that all of it is a state of mind, and do not let that state be dictated by any influencer, even me. This is the age of independent media. In many ways, we're going to be able to think the freest we've ever thought in the entire time this whole industry has been going on. You can choose for yourself what's relevant. You can choose for yourself what to pursue. That's just like speed one. I think it's flying. Okay, that was speed two, but speed one is still freaking going pretty fast. All right, let's see what it let's see what it can do. Oh crap! Well, wow, that's really going very fast. Hey, come back! 
Hey! Yeah. Well, thing doesn't kick me right off. That is fast. That is like seven mile an hour. <laughs> That's fast. And I'm not even on the max speed. Huh. That was sweet. Step on just ever so slightly. Oh, I can get used to this. This is legit. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this is all right. It doesn't handle as well up front as it does like right here in the middle. I bet you probably if we had dropped a mod here to do it in the middle, but it'd just be too hard to clear the weeds if it got caught up in a lot of other things. That's why I didn't actually drop it through the middle. Could it have gone through the middle? Yeah, but I don't know. It's... The top and the front, you have ultimate control of where the wind points you when you have spot lock. So that's part of the reason I did it. Another reason I really wanted to push the Endura is because look, See my platform here? There is no major space taken up by the trolling motor. Say for a, a motor guide X3 or a power drive or any of those things, they would take up a lot of space and they require a mounting bracket and quick release brackets and all these other things. And I don't need any of that crap. I just need to make a front transit mount. It takes up no space. That's the least space a trolling motor can take up is the transit mount trolling motor. And I'm steering it currently just with this. So you have dual steering here on the kayak. That's so I don't have to really rely on the electronic steer unless I really need to just use it. But I mean, I'm fine just steering it like this. I really am a big fan of the Dorado steering. Now I'm tired of steering. So I'm just gonna let this thing do it all by itself. Right now, the Tron motor is in complete autopilot with the nav block hitting feature. So I want it to go here. We've got a pretty good, this is like my favorite little zone here. Down this little cove. We can go ahead and hit spot lock. There it is. Stuck me right on point. It turned me around a complete 360 to put me back on the point where we locked it. We've been holding here pretty steady. This wind has gotten increasingly more aggressive, and we've been still between these two these two buoys pretty co collectively the whole time. Just stop here to potentially re-strategize what I'm gonna do here. Let's go ahead and give the old fish finder a try. There, transducers deployed. there. Where are they? Right here? Is that right underneath me? Hmm. I'm gonna have to drop. Ah, oh, you stupid fish. Oh, come on. It's a bunch of little pecker bluegill, and then there's a few big bass swirling the area. I can't tell which one is which. You know, this is actually really relaxing. I always just max out the whole rig to fish the best it can. I don't really give a crap about the seat, but man, this gravity seat, it's making my morning a lot better. Yeah, just out here, just dragging a worm. There's fish that randomly come in and out of the panoptics. They are definitely here. But that's the best turret I've ever made for anything. That's the most low profile, right in your face, easy to control, never gonna go out of tune turret. I love it. I'd really love it if I got a fish here though. Let me see if I get a fish here. When I posted demo reels and YouTube shorts about these anchors, I got a lot of comments saying, why would you even get anchors when you can just get spot lock? Well, I have spot lock and I'll tell you, 
in the shallow water, especially the shallow water with no wind, you still need some sort of anchoring system. And the Crab Lake-like anchors are the best system. They're better than any sort of spud pole design, even the micro anchors, which are an electronic spud pole design. Yeah, those are nice. They probably would have done all right for this kayak. It's not very heavy, but I just have a bad taste in my mouth from spud pole designs just failing and then having to reach back there and pull them out of the electronic motor anyways because they spine and get stuck and twist. It doesn't really happen with a crab leg design, especially when it's not relying on electricity or a motor to actuate. So I can just dig those in and press on those levers to dig the anchors in farther and I'll stay there no matter how much the wind tries to push or drift me all stay fairly straight hey guys thank you so much for hanging out here to the end of the video and going us through as we built this thing and made it come to life had a blast in this thing but i'm ready for the next thing we're gonna do and what is that this although it's already built up yeah this is a production mini bass boat this is a production yak killer this ladies and gentlemen meet the light skiff made by milia boats and this is the same length and roughly the same size, obviously a little wider th as this. And it's about the same cost, but what's the difference? This is a kayak and this is a legit production roto molded plastic bass boat with tons of storage and all the bells and whistles of things that I personally would include inside a build to make this boat relevant. It's already done, produced and ready for you to buy. Start from front to back, all the features that it has. One, you have dry stows. You have three of these that you can put your, your belongings in or immediate tackle in, whatever you're using. Another one there, another one there for each side, three total. Rod holders, cup holders molded right into the hull. T-tracks also installed into the hull. And then your first storage, which is pretty generous. And here, if I this was me, I would use this for my primary tackle plus day box stuff that I would use. I'd be right up here in the front fishing anyways. To compound on that, it's got two very generous stow lockers here. See this? I got all my gear in here. You got a cooler, you got a life jacket, extra tackle bag, and that's just for me. For the co-angler, it's got his own one. This holds quite a bit. Okay, and in here, they suck the scupper plugs. What are the scupper plugs for? Because this is a self bailing deck. If we look in here, you notice this is a water diversion lip. It's just pretty high protruding. So the chances of water actually getting in here are very minimal. Most of it is gonna drain around the sides, come out here, and then go down the self bailing area here. It then goes out to one of these two ports. So there is no need for a bilge in this boat ever. It's ready to go right now. If you do wanna run wiring through it, you can. Because you can access inside of the hole to these three main access points. And there's fairly large cavities you can use fish tape and run you run your little trickster stuff through there to get wires in. So we plan on, we do plan on wiring this boat with some minimal wiring, it doesn't need a whole lot. Better cup holders, more rod holders, more T-tracks, and even spots here to bolt on a wheel dolly system, which actually works really well, and I can't wait to get that. Check out the very generous back storage. Same stuff, same self belling design, but look how big it is. Okay, that's a 100 amp hour battery. That's a three gallon gas tank. This could easily hold a six gallon and two or three more of these batteries and still have room, wiggle room to do it. Like if you wanted to do that, that's how much is here. So we could store even more stuff back here. And I know there's no rod locker and I don't even know if I would want a rod locker in a boat like this, just because of how much it would compromise everything else. So to offset that, they have, uh, they have a grouping of rod holders back here. They protrude the rods straight up. They don't flare out. So they're not like, it's not like they're gonna catch a tree if you're if you're bordering one grab handles your own kind of like back tray for tackle for the co-angler let me see down here we see the capacity is 200 two persons or 300 pounds i'm not really sure how the coast guard because these were out of brazil first when you see the ones in brazil they have two to four people on this thing with a 99 in the back and they're flying so it's definitely capable of more but because of U u.s coast guard ratings which are not worldwide ratings they're just the uscg still important but i don't know how they come up with their formula if this thing is like close to 500 pounds then this thing is not it's more there's even foam in here to show you that they, they do have foam in here you can even add more if you wanted to make this thing ultra sink proof or ultra rigid you could also add more foam in here i'm reluctant to do that yet because for one i want to try the boat out stock and then 
got his own drain plug back here and i think if we start putting foam in there without really knowing where it's going to go that they could hinder the flow of water if water should get into the hull it can be taken out also has a very robust aluminum transom and i do mean robust going all the way down mounted at six points safety check for quality assurance to the torque value and this thing is ready to go this thing will fit right in the back of a truck bed with a bed extender which you would use similar for kayaks all right guys thank you so much for tuning in stay tuned for more stuff on this light skiff and also for the 1648 weekend warrior build we'll be getting to both of those here very soon stay tuned